So I have about 15 minutes to tell you about probably the coolest project that I've ever had the opportunity to work on called the, uh, the Lunar Ice Cube. Uh, but I want to provide a little bit of context. I mean, why, why are we doing space in Kentucky? And then why are we building a spacecraft to, to go to the moon? So um, I've given a subtitle here to uh, my talk of uh, Kentucky's Quiet Aerospace uh, Evolution. So let me just say a quick word about that. Um, aerospace, in general, accounts for about 15% of the U.S. economy. 15% of the U.S. GDP is related to aerospace. So it is incredibly important um, countrywide. Uh, but what about in Kentucky? Um, believe it or not, we became an aerospace state in 2013. 2013, um, we saw aerospace become Kentucky's number one manu manufactured export. It's an $8 billion industry in Kentucky. Uh, so we actually, we rank number three in aerospace exports. Now, if you, th when you think about Kentucky, uh, it's probably not uh, aerospace that comes to mind first. I mean, you think about thoroughbred, you think about the distillation industries, and those are on important aspects of our economy. But believe it or not, they're all uh, well beneath uh, aerospace. And in fact, I can show you how it all shakes out uh, pretty quickly here. So this was, uh, this was 2014, so it's actually even a little bit better now. Uh, but aerospace uh, products and parts account for uh, about $8 billion in, in, the US, or in the Kentucky economy. Um, automotive industry is second. Look at d distillation is uh, down there at third. Equine industry is also uh, sort of tied for third. But we are an aerospace state. How many of you guys knew that, by the way? Raise your hand if you, if you knew that. Okay, yeah, so we needed to go out and tell the, uh, you know, uh, don't keep the secret anymore. We need to uh, let this be known. So, uh, yeah, so we, we are an aerospace state in Kentucky. So what does that mean for the young people um, here? Uh, well, first of all, it means that uh, we have a robust job market. So aerospace is high tech. It requires electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, software developers, aerospace engineers, of course. Um, but there is a robust job market actually in Kentucky. So we have this great program, Space Science Program at Moorhead State. And when we started a few years ago, uh, the graduates, they all had to go to California or Colorado to get a job. And I, it always worried me because, you know, I thought one of the uh, goals of the universities in Kentucky was to, you know, help promote economic development. And here we were taking our best and brightest kids and giving them a fantastic background and then sending them to California to work. Something was wrong with that picture. We don't have to do that anymore. With the uh, aerospace market the way it is in Kentucky, a lot of our kids can stay here and help grow our economy. And so we're starting to see that now, and I'm really, really excited about it. So our role at Moorhead State is in the areas of uh, nanosat technologies. And we like to think that the, the next big thing is small. Uh, if you think about the um, technology that goes into electronics these days, it's just incredible. I mean, look at your cell phone, for example. Um, look at the amazing technology in your cell phone. So I tell this to my students, but they don't believe me. When I got my first cell phone, guess what it could do? One thing. See, they don't even know. You won't believe it, right? It could make a phone call. That was it. Yeah, they don't believe me. <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe, but look at that technology. So we're using this micro nanotechnology now for, in a lot of different areas, in automotive, uh, in heavy industries, and in, in certainly in aerospace. So what that means for us now is that we can put enormous capabilities into tiny, tiny little packages. Well, why do you want to build small satellites? Well, they're cheaper to launch. You can fly them in constellations of dozens or even hundreds. You can get greater spatial coverage. Uh, they can do certain things. If you've got 100 satellites up, you can get uh, a much greater spatial coverage, uh, for example, than you could with one monolithic satellite. So there are a number of applications for these, for these nanosats. Uh, so that's sort of the climate in which we're, we're doing our, uh, our work at Moorhead State. Um, big capabilities, uh, small sizes. This, uh, this is a project we're working on. That's a supercomputer, by the way. It's an eight-node supercomputer. Fits in the palm of your hand. Um, so we built that with a, com a company called Honeywell. But um, what I really want to do today is tell you about the coolest project that we're working on, uh, which is the, well, let me, let me uh, tell you how we, how, first of all, how we got there. So, um, you know, you, you can't do this kind of thing alone. So uh, we work for a parent organization called Kentucky Space, and we work with other universities, and we have uh, private sector, small businesses that all work together. Uh, toward this end of uh, developing uh, and commercializing nanosat technologies. Um, but what we focus on at Moorhead is in the area of nanosats, uh, the tiny, tiny little satellites. 
Um, we've had the great pleasure to fly five spacecraft. Five spacecraft that have been built in Kentucky, and Moorhead specifically, have flown in space. Can you believe that? Five spacecraft. Uh, there are a couple orbiting the Earth right now with, uh, with student fingerprints on them. But this is our portfolio of, of missions that we've flown so far. But today, I want to tell you about the coolest one. Uh, and I know we've got partners all over the world, but I'm going to skip through. Please come and visit us. But I want to tell you about Lunar Ice Cube, because it's the coolest thing. So did you guys all get to see the, the NASA Space Launch uh, System exhibit out there? Yeah, if you didn't, uh, please, please go by and see it, because it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, but we uh, had an opportunity to, uh, to, um, to, to win uh, a big NASA contract. It's about a $9 million contract to build a space probe, a uh, nanosat space probe, uh, size of basically a, a carry-on piece of luggage, uh, to go to the moon. And it's going to take a ride on the SLS system. So here it is. This is the Lunar Ice Cube. And it was one of 13 spacecraft that are selected to, to ride on EM-1 to go to various destinations. So we're doing this in partnership. We have some fantastic partners. Moorhead State is the lead on it, uh, but we have NASA Goddard Space Flight Center building the instrument, which is an infrared spectrometer. Um, we have the Jet Propulsion Laboratory helping with the science, a company called BUSEC, uh, which is a propulsion company. You have to have an electric propulsion system to get there. Uh, Vermont Tech and, of course, Kentucky Space, our parent organization. Um, so what are we going to do with this thing? So um, the, the primary purpose, this is a science mission. It's a planetary science mission. And the primary purpose is to look for water ice on the moon. We're trying to figure out where the water ice is uh, and how it's located and to try to understand the physics of how water ice moves from one place to the other. Well, well first of all, why do you care about water on the moon? Who, who really cares? Um, we care because when we go back to the moon, it's going to be different. When we went to the moon uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, we planted some flags, we left some boot prints, we picked up a few rocks, we learned about how the moon was formed, and we came back to Earth, and that was it, right? When we go again, we're going to stay. We're going to build lunar outposts. We're going to build radio astronomy observatories on the far side of the moon, optical observatories. We're going to mine this, the regolith of the moon for its mineralogy. It has an incredible uh, asset called helium-3, which is a fusile material uh, that uh, produces an enormous amount of energy. So when we go there, we're going to use the moon for practical purposes. To do that, if you want to support astronauts and workers and miners on the moon, you have to live off the land as much as you can. Water is a magic material, right? So water, of course, the astronauts to drink, but break it apart, you get oxygen to breathe, and hydrogen, which is rocket fuel. So it's an important asset. So we really need to know where the water is to be able to, uh, to make use of the resources there. So that's what we're trying to do with some of these missions, is try to figure out where the water is on the moon. We know, we know there's water there, but where, where is it and how does it get there, and some of the uh, sort of subtle aspects of, of the location of water ice is what we're really looking at. So how do you get to the moon? It's not easy. You need a really big rocket. Well, we're in luck because NASA is building the largest rocket ever built in the history of the world right now, right? So uh, it's this guy here, Space Launch System. And again, there's a great display. There's a, uh, you know, well, it's not a full-scale model because it wouldn't fit in the building. <laughs> uh, but it's a nice model of uh, SLS, and here it is. So, you know, why do you need a new rocket, right? We got SpaceX building the Falcon series. We got Orbital building the Antares series. Those are fantastic small companies building excellent rockets. So why does NASA need a big rocket? Well, those are great rockets, uh, uh, Falcon 9, for example but they can only go to low Earth orbit, three, 400 miles up, and that's it, right? So to go to Earth escape, to go to the moon, to go to asteroids, and ultimately to Mars, you have to have a honking big rocket. And that's what SLS is. It will be the most powerful rocket ever flown in the history of the world when it launches in 2018. So the first time it flies, uh, it's not gonna have astronauts. Uh, it will have the Orion space capsule, uh, and they're gonna swing Orion around the moon and test the systems out bring it back to Earth and make sure that it all works fine. Then the EM-2, Exploration Mission 2, the second time it flies, uh, it will indeed have astronauts on it. Uh, here's the cool thing. The second time it flies, it'll probably go to an asteroid, in my opinion, a near-Earth asteroid. So this thing is an incredibly capable launch vehicle. So since they're not carrying astronauts the first time, NASA decided, hey, we got all this extra room, and we're going to Earth escape, which takes an enormous amount of energy to get out of the gravity well of the Earth. But once you're out of the gravity well of the Earth, you can go to all kinds of cool places. So they decided, well, you know, we're, we're going there. Why not take along some secondary payloads? So they decided to take 13 secondary payloads along with them. And uh, the cool thing is, out, uh, out in the display, they actually have the, the MSA, the MPCV stage adapter. 
here, and there are 13 little nanosats that will live in that adapter. And once the rocket gets uh, up to Earth, it's going to orbit the, uh, the Earth a couple times, uh, the upper stage, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, and the Orion space capsule, orbit the Earth a couple times, and then uh, it will start heading to the moon, right? And so it'll eject the capsule, the Orion capsule. The Orion capsule will go and swing around the moon, orbit the moon, test the systems. But the ICPS stage, as it's heading toward the moon, it's going to eject these 13 CubeSats, and they're going to go to a lot of really interesting destinations. Uh, four are going to the moon, uh, one's going to an Earth asteroid. Uh, there's a couple with the Department of Defense, we don't know where they're going. Uh, a few European ones, but there are 13 uh, secondary payloads that, that get to tag along. So we were chosen, um, actually 13th, <laughs> but hey, it's okay we were chosen, right? So these are some of the, uh, the payloads that are going along on EM-1. Mostly they're NASA payloads, but look at this one. Lunar Ice Cube, Moorhead State, and its partners. So we're just ecstatic to be on the big rocket. So let me tell you a little bit about the mission itself. And I can get going here. Well, how do you, how do you get, so here's, here's the problem, getting to the moon, right? So, um, so here's the thing, we get a ride to Earth Escape on a big rocket, and we swing by the moon, but we can't really get into lunar capture. What we're gonna try to do is orbit the moon, get really close in, we're gonna be at about 100 kilometers paraloon, so the closest approach we're gonna make, 100 kilometers above the lunar surface, and we're gonna look for water ice with an infrared spectrometer by orbiting the moon, right? But uh, here's the problem, so we get to Earth Escape, and we get to the moon in three and a half days, but guess what? Uh, you have to go about 25,000 miles an hour to get to Earth Escape. So when we fly by the moon in three and a half days, we're going 25,000 miles an hour. We don't have enough energy to slow down and get into lunar capture. So we have to go through this long, elaborate, circuitous route to, to actually get to the moon with the right energy state to get into lunar capture. So we do a lunar flyby in a few days. Uh, another 100 days later, we swing back around the Earth. Uh, we exchange energy with the Earth, and we finally get into lunar capture. And then it takes a while to spiral down to get to our, our science orbit. But let me say a, a thing or two about how you, how you get there. So here's a, here's a technological challenge that we figured out a really interesting answer to. Um, the, the, the amount of energy it takes to get from one place to another in space, we, we describe it in terms of a mathematical feature called delta V, the, amount, the change in energy you need to get from one place to another. Uh, to get from Earth escape to lunar capture, it takes 2.8 kilometers per second of delta V. Okay, so we get to Earth Escape, and if we were going directly to, to the moon to get there, we would have to have 2.8 kilometers per second of delta V capability. Well, to do that, we are um, carrying along a, an incredibly cool little engine. It's an electric propulsion system. It's an RF ion engine, right? It creates this plasma field of ions We're using an iodine fuel, sends it out at high velocities, propels the spacecraft in the opposite direction. Uh, it's an incredible little engine. And it's kind of a slow, graceful acceleration. If you're not really in a big hurry, ion engines are perfect. If you're trying to get to some place in a hurry, ion engines are not as good as, as uh, chemical propulsion. Um, but, so we got this great ion engine. It's made by the Busek company there in MIT spinoff. And with the fuel that we can carry, I mean, imagine this thing, and there's a model of it out there. This thing is the size of a carry-on piece of luggage, right? So you can't fit a, a huge engine in it. So here's the thing, with the, uh, with the engine, oh, and by the way, I took this uh, photo with my cell phone. That's uh, the engine under fire at the Busek company in Boston uh, in the uh, thermal back chamber. And they let me sneak up there with my cell phone and take a picture. Uh, it's actually kind of gone viral now, <laughs> uh, which is pretty cool. But anyway, so with this engine, we can create 1.2 kilometers per second of delta V. And what did we need? 2.8. Yeah, we're not even close. But brilliant physicists have figured out uh, this thing called low energy trajectories. There are sort of gravitational highways that run through the solar system. It's really kind of hard to understand, and I can't explain it really very well in a minute. But you can think of it as, uh, you know, every, um, every two bodies in the solar system have sort of gravitational equipotential. So in other words, you've got the Earth and the Moon. You can find a place in between where the gravity balances. That's an equipotential point. We'll add three or four bodies and uh, they're all in motion. You can imagine they're sort of ridges that run through the solar system that where you, uh, if you ride that ridge, it doesn't take as much energy as if you fall off that ridge. And these are gravitational superhighways. So we figured out how to use one to go to the moon. So we start off with the Earth. We get uh, to Earth escape uh, velocity with the big rocket. We swing by the moon, again, going 25,000 miles an hour, can't stop. We go way out in the middle of nowhere, a million and a half kilometers away. We swing back by the Earth. 
Uh, we swing up to 2.2 million kilometers out, and we fall back into the Earth-Moon system, and we finally catch up with the Moon with just the right amount of energy. So it took the astronauts three and a half days to get there. Guess how long it's going to take us with this mission? 187 days. But hey, we get there, right? <laughs> and then another 90 days to spiral down. Uh, so it's pretty cool. That, uh, the, the blue arcs are actually the, the spiral down phase to get into the science phase. Uh, then we're going to um, uh, track the moon, look at the, the water ice. And here's the kind of data that we're going to collect. It's an uh, infrared uh, point spectrometer. And we're looking at the, uh, the infrared signature of water ice. Incredible instrument, miniature technology. Uh, here's the view of the spacecraft. And so we are really excited about it. And I'm going to skip to the end. We track it with the big dish at Moorhead. What amount of time, so I'm going to skip to my conclusion. So, uh, you know, what's the takeaway from this? Well, uh, Kentucky somehow quietly has become an aerospace state. So for young people, there are incredible opportunities in aerospace, not in Southern California, but in Kentucky. Uh, meanwhile, NASA's building the largest, most powerful rocket ever built in the history of the world, and we're going to be on the historic maiden voyage. Students from Kentucky will get their fingerprints literally on the moon. So really, it's not an exaggeration to say that we're entering a new era of space exploration based on nanosat technologies. So I think I must uh, have to end there. I don't know if I have time for questions, but I'd be happy to stick around if, uh, if you have any. Thank you.